waves transmit energy and we're going to derive the rate at which energy is transferred across a wave. So what you see is if I oscillate this up and down on this frictionless pole, I'm going to produce a wave that's traveling in this direction. It's going to transmit power to the string at this rate. We know that power is transmitted for two reasons and we're going to derive that power using both of them. One, we know that there's energy in the system here because this is a little harmonic oscillator, this chunk of string, moving up and down and it's going to have energy. Here, there's no energy. But in a moment, because the wave is traveling with the speed of a wave equal to the square root of tension over mu, there's going to be energy here. And so that rate of energy transfer is power. Power is equal to the amount of energy given the amount of time that it takes for this chunk of string to get that energy. Also, I know that power is equal to force times velocity. In order to start this wave propagating this energy, I'm going to have to push up on this string. Why? Because it's pulling down on me. There's tension here. And I have to pull up with some velocity. So there's some y component of force that I have to provide when I'm pulling up with the y component of velocity. And so we don't get this mixed up with the speed of the wave. Let's write force in the y direction times y dot, which is a vector. We know as this wave travels, it can be described by this wave function where the y position at any given time is equal to the amplitude times sine omega t plus v, some phase shift. And the velocity of that piece of string, up or down, because the string piece is moving up and down while the wave moves this way, is y dot, which is a derivative of this. So sine becomes cosine, and you take the derivative of the inside term and get this omega. So let's take a chunk of string and find what its energy is as it oscillates up and down as the wave goes by. Now we're going to use the small angle approximation, which I don't show right here. This is, this is at a very small angle. So dl is equal to dx. The little bit of length of string we pick is equal to the little bit of delta x on the string. And so we know that the energy of an oscillator as it moves up and down is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And it transitions between the two at this point, the particle only has potential energy in the deformation of the string. At this point, there's no potential energy, it's all kinetic energy. And so, in here, somewhere in the middle, it's, it's the sum of them. But this is equal to the kinetic energy max, and it's also equal to the potential energy max. And on average, half the energy is in potential, and half the energy is in kinetic. But I'm going to say, okay, the energy is equal to the maximum kinetic energy, which is just equal to one-half mv max squared. And again, so I don't get that mixed up with the speed of the wave, the speed of the particle is just y dot. And so I'm looking at the maximum y dot squared. And that's just equal to what? One-half. So what is the mass of this string? It's going to equal mu times the little bit of dl, which I'm going to say is equal to mu times dx. And that's the little bit of mass of this chunk of string. So I can write one half mu dx times y dot squared is omega squared a squared cosine squared omega t plus v. And I want the maximum of this. So I know what this is. This is a value that's somewhere between zero and one because you square it. And so the maximum is 1. And so now I have 1 half mu dx omega squared a squared. The power that this wave transmits to this chunk of string dx is equal to the energy it's going to get divided by the amount of time it takes to go that distance. And I can just write this in now and I get 1 half mu omega squared a squared times dx dt. And what's dx dt? That's how fast the wave is moving. So I can write that now as one half mu omega squared a squared square root of t 
over mu. I can simplify it because this is just like mu squared in here. So I can put it inside the square root and I have one half omega squared a squared square root of the tension times mu, the mass density. And I don't want to mix this up with the period, so I'm going to put a subscript S for tension in the string. Omega mu. Let's check units. Omega squared is per second squared, A is meter squared, and tension is newtons or kilogram meters per second squared, and mu is kilograms per meter. And this cancels, and then I know this is a square root, so this kilogram squared per second squared comes out in kilograms per second. And what do I have? Kilogram meter squared per second squared, that's joules per second, is a watt. It's the power transmitted, it's the rate of energy transfer. So how about the rate at which I put power into the wave? And so for this, we just have to look at what is the force I am putting on the string to pull it upwards. And it's not equal to the tension because the horizontal component of the tension is provided by this rod. I am just pulling against the vertical component of that tension. So I'm going to write this is the tension in the string but just the y component and this is y dot. Now the y component in the string is actually a function of how fast I'm moving of y dot. Why is that? Because the string is at an angle because I'm moving up at this point. Okay, when I was down here, the wave was back here. I've moved up this distance in a certain amount of time and the wave has moved forward in that same amount of time. So this distance is proportional to the velocity of the wave and this distance is proportional to the velocity of me pulling the string up or of the particle moving upwards. And so I can look at this theta and say that, oh, tangent theta is equal to y dot over v of the wave. Why is that important? Because I could just also say this is the tension in the string that's pulling in this direction. But I could write that tension as tension down. This is the vertical component of the tension tension in the y direction, and this is tension in the x direction pulling that way. And this is what I'm pulling against. And I can see these are related by tangent theta because this is the same triangle. And so I can write now that tangent theta is also equal to the vertical component, the y component of tension, divided by the x component of tension. I'm going to do something a little radical in that I'm going to say again for the small angle approximation this tension along the string is equal to the horizontal component because the cosine of a small angle is 1. And so I'm going to write that this is the tension in the y direction divided by tension. So using this relationship I can write the tension in the string in the y direction is equal to the tension itself times y dot over the speed of the wave. And I have a nice expression, bring down the y dot from above, for the power that I have to transmit to the string in order to make this wave go. So this is equal to the tension times y dot squared over the speed of the wave. And I can write that now as tension over the square root of tension over mu times y dot which is omega squared a squared cosine squared omega t plus v. So I can write this as the square root of tension squared and it cancels with one of these and I get a square root of tension times mu. And then I have omega squared times a squared. Now there's a problem because there's a one half here and not over here. And that's because this is not the maximum speed in the vertical direction. We can see that when I'm up at the top, I'm not moving. Velocity is zero. And also, the wave is horizontal at that point. The string is horizontal, so there's no vertical tension. 
So here power goes to zero, and here power is maximum when the angle is maximum and I'm moving at maximum speed. And we see that in this portion of the formula, that this is cosine squared omega t, and that goes between one, when I'm in equilibrium, pulling really fast and really hard, and zero, when I'm turning around. And so this function cosine squared looks like this. If this is zero, it looks like this, oscillating symmetrically between one and zero, and guess what its average is? one half. And so when I average this out over time, I get the one half and these are the same. There's one more thing worth discussing about the power that a wave can transmit to you, like the power that we can gather from sunshine or the power that we can get from ocean waves. We can express the intensity of the wave as the power that the wave has divided by the total area that it's distributed over. And so we're used to this ubiquitous inverse square law where we talked about how gravity is going to drop off like 1 over r squared because the area that you spread those gravitational field lines over is 4 pi radius squared. And so this is good for sunlight, it's good for sound, it's good for cluster bombs, that the energy is spread out over this surface of this sphere. And because the area grows like r squared, the intensity of the light, of the sound, of the nails that hit you from the cluster bomb drop off like the distance squared. But what if it doesn't spread out in two dimensions? What about a water wave? You throw a rock into the water, boom, and it makes these waves that move out in all directions. And you look at the area that they're spread out over. But they don't spread this way. They only spread this way. And so this area is just equal to, you know, the height of the wave as it comes out times 2 pi r to the first power. So the energy of the wave, as the radius doubles, let's say, only spreads out by twice as much. And so for a two-dimensional wave, like this could be the wave in a big piece of, let's say, stretched rubber film, and you whack it in the center and it makes this wave that goes off. It's going to drop off in intensity just like r to the first power. And so how about r to the zero? What if it's moving just in one dimension, not spreading out in two dimensions, not spreading out in three dimensions? We have waveguides, and so if we have an electromagnetic wave, we can put it in this square hollow pipe, and the wave travels, and it doesn't get weaker at all. You could see this in a water wave in a canal. Actually, there's a story about a guy in Britain who watched a wave in a canal, and he followed the wave for miles, and the wave just continued on without getting weaker. Why? Because it wasn't spreading out at all. So the next time you see a wave, think about it's a transmission of power. And if it spreads out, if it spreads out in three dimensions, it's going to drop off like r squared, because the area grows like r squared. If it spreads out in two dimensions, it's going to it's going to drop off in intensity like r to the negative 1, and if it's in one dimension and doesn't spread at all, then its intensity remains constant.